reading from the second chapter of Ephesians. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. Let's pray. Lord, we pray at this time that you would silence in each of us any voice but yours. If hearing your word we may believe, and believing your word we may obey your will. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, like in many of your families, school started for us this week, and it was kind of exciting. We dropped off Karn and Peter, I did, for the first time since before spring break. And I don't know, that was satisfying on many levels, kind of a relief in many different ways. Uh, but it was really exciting for them too. And uh, you know, there was nervousness and excitement, all the emotions that go through it. So I dropped them off. And later on when they had gotten home, I heard Allie talking to him after school. And uh, Karen uh, said to Allie, she said, I have the nicest teacher ever. And Peter responded, no, my teacher is way nicer. And what I loved about that is they were arguing over who had the nicest teacher. So apparently we have nice teachers this year, and they're even arguing over who has the nicer teacher. That's a good thing, I'm guessing. Apparently nice is the gauge by which second and fourth graders, at least in our family, gauge the quality of their teacher. Now, I don't know if that's a perfect gauge or not, but I want to ask you a question this morning. What is the measure, if we're really honest, what is the measure that you and I use to gauge or assess who Jesus is to us? And you might say, assess Jesus. You can't do that. That's totally wrong. And you may be right. But we do, don't we? And we do so all the time. So go with me for a minute on this. If you were going to tell someone the most important benefit of, the most important thing about being a follower of Jesus Christ, what would it be? What would you say? How would you state your case? And I want you to really think about answering that question before I answer. What would you say? I mean, maybe one of the things that you could say is that you want to positively impact people on the other side of the globe through the ministries of your church. People that you'll never meet in this life will benefit because you are a follower of Jesus Christ. Their lives will be changed because of what you're doing here today as a follower of Jesus. You know, maybe you would say that you do so because you can change the tone and the vibe of your family as a follower of Jesus. That because you're following Jesus, you can change the lives of the people in your inner circle, your sphere, your relationships, because of your attitude, your joy, your love, your passion, your perspective, the way you see them through the eyes of God. Namely, that you see them through a different lens. You know, maybe you would say that it could change your life. I mean, your attitude, your emotions, your inner life, more joy, more peace, more patience, more kindness, etc. That is the most important thing about the presence of Jesus, you would say, because he's changing you from the inside, making you into a new creation. You know, maybe you would say that Jesus has given you power. The power to overcome, the power to overcome shame, the power to overcome sorrow, the power to overcome fear, the power to overcome bitterness, the power to live with addiction, the power to become, to overcome the challenges in your life, whatever they might be, because you view those challenges differently and you view those challenges from a life which has been changed and with someone helping you overcome those challenges, literally the presence and the power of God. Your core verse is probably something like, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You know, maybe you would say it was the supernatural aspect of faith, that the literal presence of God, the Holy Spirit of God, 
has promised to take up residence in you and that's unlike anything else in the rest of this earth and that is by far the most prominent important part of Christian faith that you are a temple of the Holy Spirit that if this is you worship is probably a super high priority for you because wherever the Spirit is moving wherever the Spirit is lurking wherever the Spirit is taking up residence in people you want to be there why because you can feel that you want more of that Maybe you would say that it's prayer, the interaction between creator and creation, God and people, that you bring before the Lord, the maker of the universe, your burdens, everything you're carrying, everything on your shoulders, and they're received, and you leave them there. You lay them at the foot of the cross. You know, what you've done, what you've been unable to do, what you struggle with, you show up in the presence of God. You interact as you've been invited to do with your Father in heaven. You know, maybe you might say it's confession and forgiveness. Again, laying it at the foot of the cross, receiving the forgiveness that God offers freely, which brings new life. Maybe you would say you have no idea no concept. You don't even know. Christianity is so new to you or Christianity is so foreign to you or Christianity is something you're not sure about yet. And, and it could be for a number of reasons. Maybe you had a bad experience once. You wrote it all off. Maybe you've just chosen to ignore God. Maybe you wrote God off when something tragic happened in your life or you'd say that you tried Christianity once and your perception was that Christianity was more rules and rituals and regulations, more jobs that you need to do, more things that you need to do, more burden to bear, and you just don't have the bandwidth for it. You might say that. And to be honest, you just haven't discovered Jesus yet, and you're not sure how or why. And maybe it works for other people, but you're just not there yet. You're open to it, but you're just not there. And maybe you would say that you experienced God's presence in worship one day or you made lifelong relationships with people that kind of share the same values and outlook that you do, that you found a way to make a difference in the world, that you're growing into a new way of doing life, that you just experienced good news. And you've just gone deeper ever since. Maybe you would say that there's something within you that just compels you to follow. That even if others don't see it like you do, there's just something in Jesus. I mean, you can feel something that is there. You intuitively realize that there is truth in him, him that transcends all these other truths that people are trying to tell you about, all these other arguments in this world that always seem to fall short. And you just can't really name the reason why, but there's something compelling you. You can feel the reason why. You just know it. And you just love to be around other people who are in that same place, even though you know they've got the same failings and shortcomings you do. You're just compelled to be a part of the community, what we call the church. Those are a lot of reasons you could probably add others to the list. Maybe you have one that's dominant in those. But again, the question, how would you assess who Jesus is? How is it that we're to gauge measure who Jesus is to us. I mean, whether or not it's wrong to do so, we do it all the time. And our lives are really the visible answer to what we value and what we don't value. The answer to that question. So what do you think about Jesus? How would you assess who Jesus is? Any of the answers I've given there are legitimate. In fact, as I was writing that whole big long list, as I was coming up with them, names and faces of people from this church and previous churches I've been at were all coming to mind because I was thinking about them and the passion that they had. And I said, this person, I remember them. They are or were so fired up about this. But let's turn it around a little bit. How does Jesus assess us? Just an aside, I was reading once about how someone said, we interpret scripture and we come to our conclusions, but something else that's happening is this. Scripture is also interpreting us as we read it 
and it comes out in our interpretations. And then what about Jesus? How is Jesus assessing us or interpreting us, you might say? And sometimes we come to some pretty harsh assumptions about what that might be, about how Jesus, what Jesus and God might think of us. You know, I think about it like this. We know our shortcomings. We know our failings. We have all kinds of ideas about how God's going to receive them. But you know what we know even more is we know our neighbor's shortcomings and our neighbor's failings. And uh, sometimes, if we're honest, we sort of hope that God is going to give them what we think they deserve, especially you-know-who. But think about passages like Romans 6. What does it say? The wages of sin is death. And we hear that and we think, well, who, who has any hope then? I certainly don't. It's kind of how we, because we know the reality. If we're really honest, we know the reality about ourselves. Verses just like that. And sometimes in our darker moments, we say, well, good, they're going to get what they really got coming. But don't forget the words that immediately follow that verse. Listen to those words. Romans again, 6. But the free gift of God, the free gift, gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amazing. How do we get that free gift? And if you think about it, it's pretty soft. I mean, that's not a hard line. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Lord means the one that we're following with our lives. In Ephesians 2, verse 8, as I read earlier, puts it like this. For it is by grace that you have been saved, by faith. And this is not from yourselves. It's a gift of God. I mean, do you hear the language in those passages? Two words I want you to hear. Gift and grace. Grace through faith. And some of you right now are hearing that and you're saying, yeah, I know it. Tell me something I don't know. I know about all that great stuff. And maybe that's a sign that you need to appreciate the words gift and grace, I would say, a little bit more. There's a reason that we call it amazing grace. It's not earned. And some of you right now are saying this. I still don't get it. I mean, gift, grace, way too easy, not fair. Uh, what do I need to do? What's the catch? I mean, all kinds of responses like that. So I want us to listen today. How did Jesus describe this life that he invites us to? How did he describe it? How did he give the invitation to those disciples and then the crowds and to people just like us, the discipleship, the invitation that he continues to give us today? How did, how did he say it? Well, here's what he didn't say. He did not say, believe in me or go to hell. Although that's often how we hear it kind of said to us, at least inferred often, you know, believe in me, so you get into heaven is kind of the other side of that coin. And people tend to shape that and receive that and think of this Jesus thing as whatever you do, do what it takes to get into the good place and do whatever it takes to stay out of the bad place. That's often how people initially kind of assess and understand and receive the whole Jesus thing, you know, it's just a Avoid bad consequences to make sure your ticket is stamped, that whole sort of notion. But is that how Jesus phrased it? No, actually not. So let's listen to the word of Jesus himself. He said this in many different places. He said, the kingdom of God has come near. Mark 1, 15. Jesus came to announce, to inaugurate, to initiate, to let us into the secret that there's a new way of being, a way of living in this world that was available to us and that is available to us. We don't have to wait until we die to experience this eternal life, this kingdom. We can experience a life that is truly life today. That's the kingdom. But how? I mean, that's always the question. Well, here's how, by responding to his call 
to do what? What did Jesus say one after another after another to all these disciples? He said this, follow me. That's what he said, follow me. You and I are invited to follow Jesus. That's what he said to all of them, follow me. Jesus invites us into being his apprentice for a living. I mean, he wants to guide you and me into a life that is truly living. Follow me, Jesus said. And then listen to these words he said elsewhere. Learn from me and you will find rest for your souls. Amazing. Let's look a little bit more at who Jesus was. You see, Jesus was a builder. The original language was Jesus was a tecton. And often that's translated as Jesus was a carpenter. But carpenter is an old and not necessarily the best translation. Today we would say Jesus was a builder, kind of like Jesus was a GC, a general contractor. Jesus was the guy out there building stuff with materials, making stuff happen. And think about where he was. He was in the Middle East, lots of rock and probably some wood. And he focused after he was done with the builder part, although once you're a builder, I think you're always a builder, what did he focus on building next? He focused on building lives, on building spiritual lives. And here's what he said to people about that. He said, build your house on the rock. Matthew 7, everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. He's no longer talking about materials like stone and wood. He's talking about building a life, building a life on the rock. And then he says, the rain falls, the floods come, the winds blow, but the house built, like Jesus said, continues to stand. And why is that? It was built on the rock. And what is the rock? The words, the life of Jesus. Jesus said, the kingdom is near, follow me, build your house on the rock. Jesus is inviting you to become his apprentice, apprentice to realize, accept that the kingdom of God, the presence of God in this world is available to you and that you can find it by following Jesus and that by doing so, you're going to be building your house on the rock. The kingdom is near. And Jesus says, follow me. Now, how do we do that? By taping, taking a step of faith in his direction, to take a next step to become an apprentice of Jesus, to commit ourselves to following him in this world. Now, I don't know where you're at. Some of you have been on this road for 50 years. Some of you have been off this road, off-roading it for 50 years, maybe just as long. Wherever you're at, it really doesn't matter. Jesus is inviting you to become his apprentice. He's inviting you to take a next step of faith. And where does it begin? With grace, with gift. Those words I read just a moment ago. To turn from your pride, how prideful are we, and to receive with humility the grace of God, the gift of God. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith then remember, this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. All of us, no matter where you're at, have a next step. You're invited to take your next step. When it comes to following Jesus, what is it? What's your next step? You know, maybe one of the items early on this summer, or excuse me, in this sermon, tugged on you a bit. You know, I listed all of those things. And maybe as I was reading through many of those different experiences people were having, one of you said, yeah, that's it. That's where I'm at. That's, or that's where I'd like to be, or that's where I'd like to go, or that's where I'd like to do. Maybe the Holy Spirit was leading you, helping you identify with one of those experiences of who Christ is. Maybe it just tugged at your heart and you said, yeah, that's where I'm at. That's where my heart is. Here's the core value for Christians, and by the way, non-Christians, wherever anyone is at, that we're lifting up today. Follow Jesus. Jesus said to people just like you, follow me. He said, the kingdom is near to you. 
He invited us to build our house on the rock. So take your next step. Become an apprentice of Jesus. Amen. We continue worship this morning with the offering. And as we say every week, we are so grateful for the generous heart and the spirit of giving of this congregation. And at this moment, we are going uh, to share in a prayer over that offering. So please pray with me. God of goodness and growth, all creation is yours and your faithfulness is as firm as the heavens. Water and word and bread, these are signs of your abundant grace. Nourish us through these gifts that we might proclaim your steadfast love in our communities and in the world. Through Jesus Christ, our strength and our song. Amen. And now if you would please join me in praying the prayer our Savior taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Just a couple of quick announcements this morning. Uh, Andy just finished talking about our first uh, sermon in our series on core values, talking about how we follow Jesus. And we will continue talking about a different core value every week for this series, so you won't want to miss any of them. Maybe you've heard the news, the rumor, the excitingness that we are back indoors on October 4th. That is not only indoor worship, but that's kids ministry with Kids Zone as well. We're actually starting all of our youth programming from Kids Zone through, uh, through Surge, uh, not including Logos at this time though, in October. So you wanna make sure to look at your emails for information on that. Now being back indoors and starting kids ministry back up means that we need to rebuild our teams and we need people to serve. If you haven't yet, we ask you to take a couple of minutes to fill out the time and talent form that you'll find in your weekly e-news and on the Facebook page and on the church website. And of course, make sure you are keeping your eyes peeled for that e-news that comes out every Thursday afternoon and evening. Uh, it has all the details of everything that's going around and all our steps and our protocols for how we're going to deal with COVID and how we're going to get back inside. Now having said all of that, please receive your blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy and the Lord fill you with peace. Amen.
measure my way through these people. Turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. For the 